thank you for joining us on this uh, Zui. Ena mana, ena reo, reo rangatira mā, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, he karakia, he tematanga te tātou. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te taonga, ki a mā kena kena ki a uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, e hi a ki ana te a tākura, he tio, he huka, he hau honga, ti hei Māori ora. Uh, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, kia ora koutou, ko Dwayne Toko Ingoa. Uh, welcome to our Zui today. Uh, today we'll be joined uh, from uh, by Wendy Shaw from Ngāpō uh, Taunaha or Aotearoa, New Zealand Geographic Board. Uh, so welcome Wendy. Uh, just to let everybody know, if you've got any questions, any pātai, please feel free to put them in the chat as we go and either uh, one of us will do our best to reply or we'll also have time for uh, some kōrero towards the end of the presentation. Um, yeah, I'm going to hand over to you, uh, Wendy, if you'd like to introduce yourself and your kaupapa and um, yeah, we'll get into it. Oh, kia ora. Dwayne, um, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Wendy Shaw, tōku ingoa, he hekere tare no, no ngā pautaunaha o Aotearoa, uh, tēnā tātou katoa. So thank you everyone for joining us on this hikoi, uh, I appreciate your time and um, hopefully there'll be some interesting snippets for you relating to official place naming in New Zealand. So um, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about the board first for a little bit of context. Then I'll speak about um, the board's online gazetteer. Then I'll speak about the LINS data service, um, a little bit about some new maps that we published uh, mid last year, Tangata Whenua place names maps. Um, then I'll just mention, give a mention for to our Oral History Atlas publication and then a bit of a shout out for our centenary at the end. So Dwayne and I haven't practiced this um, webinar together, so hopefully we match up with what I'm saying and what he's um, bringing up on the screen. Uh, but Right now, it's it's the about the geo board. So there's a link that we'll be sharing. We have ten members on the board. Um, there's a broad cross section. Excuse me, of New Zealanders. Um, currently, half of the board members are Maori. So um, the board makes decisions on official place names by upholding standards for consistency and good naming practice. So our standards for various uh, types of place names are available online. And um, Dwayne's just brought up the link there, which will be shared. Uh, what we also do is usually uh, the board will name, well, there's a preference to name one place for one feature. So there's one agreed and correct name. That's, and that's really important from an emergency management and response perspectives perspective as well as recognising New Zealand's unique culture and heritage. However, sometimes we apply or the board applies dual and alternative names to recognise equal significance. Um, and another way that we can recognise and acknowledge original Māori names is to collect them in the gazetteer for discovery and to show um, the histories and stories associated with those names. So um, I've got an example which Duane has brought up here of Rangitoto Island, which if he scrolls down to the bottom, you can see there are links to the two other uh, collected names that came through the Treaty Settlement for Tamaki Makoto back in 2016. I can't quite remember the date and I can't see it there, but you can see um, in the gazetteer we have the polygon, the map on the left showing the extent of the island and on the panel that drops down we have other information relating to the history, origin, meaning. We also, I don't know if you can share the audio for that particular, or those particular ones. Is that possible, Dwayne? Does that, that come I think through? We, 
Maybe no. I'll, uh, I'll just stop share and I'll just reshare and just okay. make sure that audio is coming through. Okay, that sounds great. Screen one, um, share sound. Here we go. There's a couple of other examples that we should maybe look at, but I'll, oh, I'll share really... a little bit more about treaty names later. Sorry, I was talking while to Homer here, so try again, Dwayne. Rangitoto Island. There we go. Does that come through? Yep. Sweet. And maybe if you link to one of the other ones. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, the audio pronunciation function that we've added later on, uh, but for now that's just a little snippet of how we've captured collected names. I'll move on to just let you know that research and consultation obviously help the board to make its informed, robust and enduring decisions. Um, the board's naming jurisdiction covers ter terrestrial New Zealand, its offshore islands, uh, undersea feature names out to the limits of the continental shelf, and then we also do naming in the Ross Sea region of Antarctica. But what the board doesn't do is name the country or roads or homesteads or businesses, um, and nor does it name the country's name. Uh, so really the board's concerned or the naming jurisdiction covers urban settlements, localities, suburbs, towns, cities, territorial authority districts and regions. And then you've got the natural features such as mountains, lakes, rivers, waterfalls, harbours, anything on the landscape that's both natural and man-made. Um, in terms of uh, proposing a place name to the board, uh, anybody can make a proposal. Um, usually it's from members of the public or council or iwi. Um, and Dwayne has brought up the page where we've got the different types of proposals that people can make. So it might be in New Zealand, it might be for an undersea feature, it might be for an Antarctic name. So slightly different processes apply. Um, yeah, and you, we also have an online form uh, as well as a, a, just a form that you can download and fill out. Um, and there is also an informational, if you could bring that up, please, Dwayne, um, that just a, a couple of pages that give a, a bit of a snapshot of what the board does, why it does it, who the board is, and then there's a process for the standard uh, place name proposals and then a process also at the bottom of the second page for um, treaty treaty name proposals which I don't plan to go into you can have a look at that yourself I'll move on now if I could to um, talking about the New Zealand Gazetteer so you had a bit of a snapshot just before with Rangitoto Island um, the the default view as you can see is there what you have along the top uh, is a search box and you have some filters for whether it's official or unofficial the feature types territorial authorities you can you can apply those as you wish um, and then down the bottom because of projections in the way that we've had to use leaflet as our uh, platform for generating this uh, data set on the web. We've got a different view for Antarctica. So if you click on that lime green, you'll see that that's the, the view we have for Antarctica. So same sort of information can be searched, but we have a slightly different view for Antarctica. Um, yeah, so I think if we could go back to New Zealand, Duane, the New Zealand view, so up the top there on that lime green bar, and if you type in um, poroti, which was, uh, um, I'm just reminding myself, um, we had a couple of people who wrote in, uh, Hona Edwards asked about porotiti, Mangakahia Road, uh, Te Tai Tokoro. Um, we don't actually have a porotiti, but we have a poroti. Um, possibly presuming that that's the, the name. So when you do a search, um, the details panel comes up and the, and the map zooms into the area that you want. You can toggle between uh, the aerial image 
base map um, or the topographic Topo 50, Topo 250 series. Um, but in this case, there's not a lot of information that we've got in that panel at the right, and that's fairly typical for a lot of entries in the Gazetteer. We've got, I think I've got some stats for you. We've got about um, 54,500 names in the Gazetteer, and many of those don't actually have um, a lot of information apart from this point, the name itself, and it's the type of feature that it relates to, uh, in this case, uh, the locality. And um, and then we also, in some cases, have history, origin, meaning, but we'll get on to that in a minute. The other name that um, somebody want, wanted information about was the Waikanae Creek. So obviously, in this case, there's lots of Waikanae Creeks. If you click on that one, I think... I think it's probably the, yes, that's the one, the one in Gisborne. So in this case, we've got um, the extent, which is not very clear in orange, for for the creek. You can obviously click on the uh, audio and listen to the audio. Waikanae Creek. And um, in terms of again, not a, not a lot of information about the history, origin, meaning. Uh, but you'll see events there, and you'll see that at the top also it says that it's an official name and that in the events it was gazetted in 2021. That was actually part of a, a, a fast-track approval process that consulted with local iwi and council to make sure that the name was correct, um, and then we made it official. Um, if we could just move on now to checking out the, I wanted to give you a few statistics. So in the board's annual report, I've also got a link. And in that, we've got a lot of, lot more statistics about, um, and, and the annual report is also available in uh, English and Te Reo Māori. Uh, and if you open it up, you can see a lot more about a section on the Gazetteer and what we captured last financial year. Um, artwork we've used from Cliff Whiting, uh, which I'll talk a bit more later on, that is in the Oral History Atlas. There's a whole section on the Gazetteer in there to give you a bit of insight. We have this field in the Gazetteer, which I've mentioned already, called History, Origin, Meaning, that ca captures the story and the meaning. But as I said, unfortunately, we don't we haven't captured a lot, but we have we have captured some. So I wanted to, if we could go back to the Gazetteer, Dwayne, um, look at some examples uh, such as uh, Stewart Island, Rakiura. So you can do a clear search if you want to just clear everything you've done. I think what I'd do is probably do a clear search in that, if that's, that's possible. Fine. Yeah, I might just refresh the. Yeah, or sometimes if, yeah, that might be easier just to go back to and start yeah. again. I think sometimes so, Chrome puts a tab to sleep as well. Yeah. It can take a moment to restart. Yeah. So obviously it goes out to a certain scale. You can zoom out a little bit to see the, the whole island. This this was um, a treaty settlement name for Naitahu in 1998. Even though our dual naming convention is with the Māori name first, um, in this case through treaty settlement they... Um, had the English name first. And you can see there under history, origin, meaning in the panel at the right, um, we've got a link to Kahuru Manu. Uh, and so that is really where we've, or well, the board has accepted that the story about uh, the name from their perspective is, um, is referred to. So rather than us in the Gazetteer repeating that information, uh, we we are linking to Kahuru Manu where we can. However, in this case, we've also got a quote from Reed's uh, New Zealand place names. So we've just added that, quoted it for a little bit of extra information. If we've got anything wrong <laughs> in the Gazetteer with these stories, we're very happy to hear from anybody to, to let us know what's right. Another example uh, of um, a name that has... A decent history origin meaning is Pukorokoro Miranda in the Firth of Thames. So again, there's an audio there for that one. If you want to 
Pukorokoro Miranda. Pukorokoro Miranda. And then, um, obviously, the history origin meaning, that was a proposal that was post-treaty settlement. They wanted to put it through the treaty settlement, but it didn't quite make it. So then through Te Arafiti, the claimants post-settlement made a full proposal to the board and the, the locality and the springs themselves and I think one other name, maybe a hill, um, the name Pukorokoro, um, was restored. And maybe just one other example, Dwayne, uh, for the longest place name, if Te Taumata Tangihanga Koro, I'm not going to say the whole thing. We'll listen to the recording, that might be nicer. Just wait a moment, I'll just type that down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just use the link so I don't get any typos. Okay, so maybe listen to what the home is. I'll do it a couple, three times. Te taumata whakatangi hanga ko auau o tamatea tūripū kākā, piki maunga horonuku pō kai whenua ki tana tahu. Te taumata so, whakatangi hanga ko auau o tamatea tūripū kākā, piki maunga horonuku pō kai whenua ki tana tahu. So with, um, with that audio, it's actually the audio for the name that we've put on the maps, not the... the uh, official name, which is slightly shorter than that. Language. The story we know refers to the peak where Tamatea, the great traveller, ascended fiercely up the mountainside, slipping and falling about so that he could play laments for his brother on his ko'owo, excuse the pronunciation. So according to Ngāti Kiri Hapu, Tamatea's younger brother was killed in conflict with Ngāti Hine when they were trying to pass through the Porangaho uh, area. And we know that Tamatea was one of the great early Māori explorers and many iwi trace genealogy ties to him, place names reflecting his adventures and deeds can be found all over the place from north of Auckland along the full length of Whanganui River, southern Hawke's Bay, east of Taihapi, southern Fiordland even, we've got um, Tamatea Dusky Sound. Um, sorry, we won't be able to, sorry, won't be able to make the sound from the next one. Yeah, that's all good. Yeah. Yes. There we go. Was somebody asking a question? No, I think it was just, just unmuted. I've just, just adjusted. Okay. Cool, cool. Um, maybe just have a look at um, Tamatea Dusky Sound, perhaps, as a, yep. as a search. And then... There we go. Yeah, so we've got the geometry for Tamatea Dusky Sound, and obviously in the panel at the right, details, we've got the, the story, the Kahu Urumanu, uh, link as well. So just really ar illustrating that, you know, we've tried as best we could to capture the the history, origin, meaning, and in that case, um, we've also got the history relating to the Cook name, Dusky Sound, as well. Um, so most of the Gazetteer entries for history, origin, meaning have come from Reed's place names of New Zealand. I think we've got about 7,000 odd from there. And then Kahuru Manu, Ngātahu's Cultural Heritage Atlas. The Dictionary of New Zealand Biography, um, which also include Māori, um, past Māori uh, di dignitaries. We've also got the board's archives, treaty claimants, and then proposers themselves. So what I would also do is encourage um, any of you to contact us um, to add or correct stories to the Gazetteer so it becomes a much fuller resource for people. Um, and, you know, obviously we're wanting to uh, make sure that they're correct. Um, so happy to chat with you also about making proposals for place names. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk with you about was collecting um, unofficial original Māori place names. So that's a, a function of the Act um, specifically to collect original Māori place names for recording on maps and charts. So you'll find that those names haven't been through the full statutory formal official process. It's a process that the Secretariat runs itself, so we would rely on Iwi to tell us this is a collected name, this is the story. We would then make sure 
you know, that any overlapping interests or other interests are sort of consulted. And then we would put that name, that collected name in in the gazetteer. So uh, Dwayne has brought up uh, Paikakariki Hill, is it, that you've brought up? Right. And, yeah, and the um, there is a, a Paia Te Rangi is a collected name, another name that's known for uh, that hill. Another example is um, where have we got it? Uh, Te Toka Atia, which Twain's just brought up. So that that particular feature doesn't have another recorded or official name in the gazetteer. It's just purely collected. And what what will happen with collected names is that they're not necessarily shown on published topo maps or charts uh, produced by our department, but they are discoverable and the story relating to them is discoverable. So they don't have an official status, uh, but they are of it. We've had this information through a treaty settlement. It's not actually a treaty settlement name, but we've, we've opted to actually collect those names. So it is a really good way of um, having those stories available and um, acknowledged and, and, and authentic as tuturu names um, to be discovered. I wanted to move on now to orthography um, and just to confirm that the board follows the orthographic convention set by Te Tauta Whiri, He Te Reo Māori, and, um, and, and that really is to ensure standardised and consistent written Te Reo Māori. Um, we've got a mahitahi agreement with Te Tauta Whiri, um, and it sets out the commitments either side for mutual benefits. And there is a, a function under the Act, again, uh, that requires the board to seek the advice of Te Tauta Whiri on the orthography of Māori place names. So it's very much a requirement of the board to do that. So on the board, we don't have a, a member who is from Te Tauta Whiri, but we do have an observer and that person's uh, role is to uh, advise the board on orthography. Um, audio files, so we've we've kind of covered that, and I've got a bunch of other examples that I can give you, but what I'll, I'll just talk through is that probably been doing it for about a couple of years now. At the moment, there are 5,712 Māori place names with audio recordings. That's about 21% of the Māori place names in the Gazetteer. There's about 21,000-ish Māori place names in the Gazetteer. So we'll continue to capture the audio. Uh, I'll be quiet for a minute, Dwayne, and you can bring that one up. Piki Kirunga, Canaan Downs. So we'll, we'll continue to do that uh, for as long as we can, for as long as we're given money to do that, um, so long as we have established the uh, orthographic uh, confirmation of, of the name. So that's with whether it's got macrons or mainly macrons. Um, cor correct pronunciation is, is really considered a success of the board, if you like. Um, and we have a, a, a strategy the board has a five-year strategy and both in Te Reo Māori and English. And if you look in there, we, the board talks about um, one of the goals being to include audio, pronunciation audio. So we're, we're getting there with that. Um, I'd just like to probably say improving knowledge and pronunciation and enhancing the gazetteer with the audio um, has followed a wider groundswell in revitalising Te Reo Māori, including similar campaigns um, in recent years by Vodafone with, with um, Google, Google the Say It Ticker campaign, Say It Right. Um, and so that sort of encouraged the board to, um, to participate in this aspect of delivering uh, good pronunciation. Um, and, of course, it's really encouraging to see whether reporting and news reporting using te reo Māori names um, in, in their reporting and in ma other mainstream media as well. Um, I've mentioned about Tahoma Hiata. She's tuhoi. I don't know if any of you know her, but she recently was an 
ONZM, last year's New Year's Honours List for her contribution to the language. Um, we've used her alone. We could have used local people, uh, so there, there might be some sort of dialectical differences, um, but, you know, it's a start, I guess. Um, what else? So just wanted to talk a little bit about treaty names. Um, under treaty settlements, there's the, under the cultural uh, redress component of settlements, place names can be restored and corrected. And uh, so the board offers advice to uh, Te Arafiti on uh, treaty settlement names. At the moment, there are about 809 I think at yesterday's count, treaty name decisions referenced in the Gazetteer, and there are around about 370 waiting in the wing. So one of those is Taranaki Maunga. Um, the example that Duane has brought it up is Otu Mutu Island, which is Ngāti Rangitihi. And as you can see there, there's a bit of a story behind the name that comes through the treaty settlement. Uh, Lake Onoki is a Ngāti Kahununuki Wairarapa Tamaki Nui Arua settlement from early last year, uh, or maybe 2022, I think it was last year. Um, and again, you know, the polygon showing the extent. We've got the audio, obviously, and the story. Um, Aoraki Mount Cook is, is one of the first ones, of course, that came to the Naitahu settlement in 1998, was the first um treaty settlement that included place names as part of the settlement redress. So they set the, the scene for other settlements to follow suit. Um, there are a few enhancements that we've got coming up to the Gazetteer. We're very aware that the real estate around um, doesn't allow for a very big map when you're viewing this, so we'd like to fix that up. But other than that, mostly the enhancements, the very small enhancements are for uh, accessibility um, issues that we've identified. Uh, so just one, also, one more plug also for complying with official names. So once a name is official, um, legislation requires that it has it has to be used in official documents um, from government and council and also documents for like maps, tourism maps and scientific manuscripts. We don't have a big compliance regime, but the idea is that once a name is made official, it becomes part of the official government record and people will start to use it eventually. And obviously on our maps and charts within Toitu Te Whenua Land Information, we are making sure that those names are updated um, as quickly as possible. I'll move on now to the um, LINS data service where we have uh, three layers of data from the Gazetteer um, and there are, so they're point line and polygon for the names and Duane already in, in, the, in the information I'm sending you has given examples of how to um, download information from LDS. But what we've done is we've put together a, a from one of the team here, Christopher Stevens, just a, a basic uh, Teams video um, of, it's one of the oh. previous ones, but if you could bring up that um, Teams recording that Chris, and then we'll, I'll be quiet for a minute while he explains the process for downloading information from LDS. Just, um, can you hear that? Presentation I'm going it's to very soft. Three ways to bring data from LDS, the LIMS data service, into QGIS, the GIS platform. So on the LDS website, you can search for data. And in this case, I'm going to be looking for place names. But this is applicable to pretty much every layer. You can add them to the map and perhaps think to yourself, wow, look at all those dots. If you go and interrogate something, you can find out what it's all about. And perhaps before you download, you'll want to crop to an area. Or perhaps not. In this case, I am going to download the entire layer. So going to export, I can create my export, download it, and then I can in fact drag and drop this zip file 
straight into QGIS. And there you have it, 55,000 points. Downloading the layer should offer good performance speed once it's actually on your computer. However, the layer could go out of date. So an alternative is to go here to services and APIs and add the layer as a WFS web feature service. So copying this and going back to QGIS, in the data sources manager, you'd create a new WFS connection. Here's one I've created earlier. Connect, add, and there you have the same thing loading up all over again. But wait, there's more. You can also run through essentially the same steps within QGIS itself. So there is an LDS plugin, and this is called the LINS Data Importer. So once you've set this up with your LDS credentials, you can use it to search for and add layers. This time I'm going to add some Topo50 maps first, just for a bit of context. And then for a third time, search for place names. Once again, the layer is streamed in as a WFS. So once you've got your data, whichever way you've gone about it, you can then proceed to do something with it. So once again, I'm going to interrogate this point. Like. And then perhaps do something else like add some labels. Or perhaps even some smarter labels. So this will label every instance of this, including the lake. And that's all there is to it. Oh, that's awesome, Christopher. Thank you so much for that. And obviously we use QGIS, but any, any other GIS product software package that you're using similar processes apply so um and and as Dwayne shared before there are other um videos youtube videos on on how to download data from lds so so that's that's the lds i wanted to now move on to um, the maps that we produced last year um, and we've got a bit of information online about it which Dwayne has just brought up um, so the two maps were published in July last year. They replaced the 1995 uh, editions that Tiawi Davis and um, Tati Benio Regan and a number of Charlie Tafio, there were a number of people involved in collecting that initial batch of information. But for these maps, we've added um, additional um names from treaty settlements directly from iwi and names that have just come through the board's processes since uh they they we we tried obviously very hard to uh consult and uh, make sure that we got the names right uh for te Ekeo maui we we had a a mail chimp email three times that went out to over 500 groups, iwi groups from Te Kahui Mangai and um, Marae Maps for Marae and then our own iwi contacts. Uh, there are around about 1,800 names uh, pre-European on both sets of maps, um, Māori and Moriori for the Chathams, Rikohu, Farikauri. Um, what... what um, for for Te Waiponamu, we were lucky with Naitahu Takare Norton, who um, consulted directly with the 18 Papatipu Marae, uh, uh, and also then for Te Tau Ihu, Top of the South, um, Mark Moses um, helped us make sure that we had the names right. But invariably, you know, 
there there may be there are errors and we've acknowledged that already for one set of errors um, on the website uh, we'll f we've fixed up the digital but obviously the the printed version um, will stay in in stock until we've run out of stock and then we'll reprint with the correct names um, so if, if you do see any, if you do find any that aren't correct, let us know and we'll keep a record of them and update them as appropriate. Um, we felt that the, the resource was um, going to be very useful for schools with the, in terms of the new history curriculum that was set last year. And in fact, Ministry of Education uh, requested, I think it was something like 3,000 extra uh, printed copies of each of the maps. What we've got on the front of each map is also a, a QR code, quick reference co code. So that allows um, schools especially probably, because on the backs of the maps, we've got the indexes for each of the um, maps and the names that are on, on them, and a little bit of a korero about those names, and then the link uh, to the current name. So we've got a digital record of that index on the back and hyperlinks back to the Gazetteer uh, as well. So I think they've been pretty well received. We distributed them obviously to all schools in New Zealand, something like 2,512 um, iwi, marae, councils, government agencies and others. Um, you know, it's... I think it's been reasonably well received, but we do acknowledge and we've had feedback um, on some errors. Uh, and so we're, we're really keen and sincere about getting those names correct, corrected. Uh, point data for these maps will be made available on LDS very shortly. Uh, it's based on the cartographic positions of the names on the maps. So that includes, again, for the Chathams, Rekohu, uh, Farikori, you'll see that they appear to be close in to, uh, to Waiponamu as they are on the maps. Um, and that's because uh, that's how we've chosen to uh, serve that information up through LDS. Um, what else did I want to say about the maps? So a georeferenced version of the both maps will also be made available through uh, base maps, uh, but we're not quite ready for that yet. I wanted to also share with you in terms of reuse, we did uh, provide data to New Zealand Herald and uh, they then produced their own interactive map which shows all the tangata whenua um, names on it as well. Just down the bottom there. Yeah. That one, and you just if you zoom in on that interactive map, Dwayne, um, wherever, eventually the names will start to appear that we provided them with. So, I mean, that's just an example of, of reuse of the names that are in the on the maps, um, yeah. And then they've obviously included our story, our corridor from the maps as well on them. Um, I think that's probably about, oh, except to say we have put all of those names where they weren't already in the Gazetteer. We've put them in the, the Gazetteer as collected names, and most of them also now have the audio as well. One, one example maybe uh, on the Gazetteer, Duane, is Te Moana uh, or Rokawa, so Cook Strait. If you go to the Gazetteer, And then obviously there's the story there. It says that it's a collected name. The Moana Oraukawa. Yeah, so um, I'll move on. I know I'm probably running out of time. Sorry, I've, I'm talking too much. But just a couple of other things. Mm -hmm. The Oral History Atlas. Um, it's a book that was produced in 1995 by the board. Again, Tiawi Davis, Tatipini. Um, and... It has about 12 waka stories. It's bilingual. Um, it's still a resource that's um, a terrific resource. It tells the stories of um, the original journeys and the names that were given. Um, and it's been illustrated by uh, Cliff Whiting 
And so, yeah, a lovely, a lovely book to look at. And the Tamatea story that I mentioned earlier, there's a much deeper account of that in that book. So use that to your heart's content. We're just about run out of printed copies of that. And we're hoping in the next few months to do another print run just of the original first edition with without any edits. Um, lastly, not quite lastly, yeah, lastly, I wanted to just talk about the centenary of the board. The board started in 1924. So this year, September this year, was when the first honorary board had its first meeting. So we've got a number of initiatives planned for uh, this year. So um, we'll be including uh, a new web page on the LINS website, um, focusing probably on a timeline of events, things like, you know, notable uh, board members of the past, Sir Api Rananata uh, was one of those original board members. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the focus of, of it is on the importance of recognising the benefits of official place naming across the decades and the board's actual contribution um, over that 100 years. Um, yeah, so watch the space. So I'd like to just thank you uh, for your attention. Um, I hope this corridor has given you some food for thought and I look forward to any questions you might have. Kia ora. Thank you.